If you've played Strider on the NES, you've witnessed what questionable physics can do. For those of you that haven't played it, you're in for a treat. Let's start with what is okay. You can stand in place, jump, and land. You can also stand on a ledge, jump off, and land. This completes our review of things Strider can do okay. If I run at this wall, will it stop me? Well, yes, but actually, no. Jumping toward the wall and holding right pushes us down the wall. Friction should slow us down, but it speeds us up. How about that left wall above this overhang? Stops us completely, sometimes even in midair. If you assume jumping while under a low ceiling would cause you to hit your head and fall, you were correct. Just don't expect it to happen immediately. Let's dive into the game's logic to find out why things seem to be so broken, and yes, this will include the dreaded triangle jump. I'll start with my own observations. Strider appears to be half-baked. Some calculations seem like workarounds and suggest programming was still playing in the physics sandbox at the time of the game's release. The physics lack optimization and cohesion, and they use a large amount of RAM for what they do. Let's start by reviewing what we've observed when it comes to implementing a typical jump mechanic. Player has X and Y coordinates. The Y coordinate is influenced by vertical velocity. That velocity is influenced by a gravity constant that is applied every frame at a known frame rate. Even if you are just standing there, there are still calculations between the frames, gravity to push you down and ejection logic to keep you out of the ground, for instance. Unless, of course, your game has bugs. Then things move in ways that don't make sense. When you press A to jump, upward velocity can just be plugged into the equation. The existing logic takes care of the rest. Strider does not use this method. Not only that, but Strider's physics are sometimes in conflict with one another. What is happening to cause all these problems? Strider uses a jump frame timer that counts down paired with a lookup table to determine which vertical velocity should be used for a given frame during a jump. Which jump frame are we on at any given moment? This one? Okay. Apply this velocity to our Y position. A lookup method might sound okay, maybe it is extra work, but it should be accurate, right? Well, if you don't erase the jump frame counter to stop a jump, the game wants to keep looking up velocities in the table, and that's what happens here. The ceiling stops us, but the jump continues. Boom. Physics tug of war. If Strider uses a table to handle going up and going down for a jump, what happens when you jump from a high platform and run out of table? What happens when the jump frames are interrupted? This is a good time to transition to numbers, and goodness knows there's too many of them. Due to the volume of logic executed on a per-frame basis, we'll use the console log to monitor values versus walk the code. Let's jump in place and get some numbers. We have a frame number, Strider's location at the end of that frame after all calculations are done, the jump frame counter counting down, and the associated velocity for that jump frame. And you'll notice that this y-coordinate, minus 8, does not equal this y-coordinate. So much for the lookup table being a simple way to implement a jump. These lookup values are compensated. So yes, we look up the jump velocity for the frame, but we also do a little bit of math. The compensation is plus 1.5 pixels. I'll add it to the log and jump again. Some frames get it, some frames do not. For this normal jump in the game, frame 23 is the cutoff. So it appears that the plus 1.5 pixels are there to reduce Strider's ascent and they go away when he is returning to the ground. We can disable the extra gravity using two game genie codes and the jump goes higher. Perhaps given more development time, the velocities in the table would have been changed, or the table would have been removed in favor of a standard formula. Who knows? Now if you think that seems broken, watch this. When you jump off this high ledge, the jump table runs out of velocities. Now what? A separate RAM address is used for what I'll call fall velocity. If the table is exhausted and Strider is not on the ground yet, fall velocity is initialized to 4.09 and is increased by almost a tenth of a pixel each frame until he hits the ground. Terminal velocity is 9. That initial fall velocity is a little strange. Why use this value? The normal jump ends with a downward velocity of plus 8. Rolling over to 4.09 means the game cuts your falling speed in half and then adds gravity each frame to speed you back up. Also, the handoff doesn't work very well. Check this out. If we use the console log, we can see that for a single frame, our downward velocity is a combined table value plus fall value for more than a 12 pixel downward movement on that frame. This is not the only hitch in this jump. It gets better, as in worse. Strider has logic to skip over some physics work when scrolling is taking place. This is probably to mitigate slowdown caused by adding scrolling to the already rather taxing logic used for frame to frame work. The problem is it doesn't skip over enough logic. Strider freezes in position for that skip frame as intended, however the jump frame counter did not freeze, 
We skipped over one frame's worth of velocity and gravity. Put simply, scrolling in Strider alters the game's physics. We are just getting started. Remember our collision problems with the walls and the ceiling? Let's see what's up. First, we're going to create on-screen boxes to illustrate targets used to discover collisions with the environment. There are a good number of them, and some targets change depending on the action performed. I've named a few of the locations checked that are also saved to RAM. That will make them easier to reference as we walk some of the logic. First up, running into the right side wall. This doesn't look right. He should stop moving right and maybe just jog in place against the wall. There are two operations happening here, wall collision and wall ejection. One of them is unnecessary as implemented. Let's first disable ejection logic using a single game genie code and see what happens when we run to the right. Am I going to run through the wall? No, I actually stopped in a way that you would expect. The stop logic sees that his head target hits a wall and zeroes out the X velocity that came from the player holding right on the controller. This continues to happen every frame and he jogs in place. What if we disable that but leave ejection logic enabled? It ejects him as soon as that front head target collides with the wall. It is almost the same as with no game genie codes. The wall collision logic ends up not mattering thanks to ejection logic throwing him four pixels to the left each time wall collision occurs. Disable both sets of logic and yeah. This is another example of physics routines that are not integrated well. Similar criteria cause the activation of different operations. What about jumping toward the right and left walls? What happens there? Welcome to the tale of two subroutines. Collision results for multiple targets are saved to RAM and checked multiple times throughout the code as needed, perhaps even too often. I don't want us to get lost, so I'm oversimplifying. Again, this is not comprehensive. For the first one executed, the code looks like this. For our focus, let's pull the following. If our front toe target experienced an environmental collision and a jump is in progress, and the jump frame counter is under 42, and we didn't land, the jump frame counter is zeroed out to cancel the jump and the X velocities are cleared to stop lateral movement. Okay, now for the second one, and this one is a bit more complex. If a jump is in progress and we have a head collision and the front heel and shin do not collide with the environment, this probably has to do with platforming logic, erase all X and Y velocities. Note that if this happens, the jump frame counter is not zeroed out. Later in the subroutine, there is an area responsible for Y velocity compensation. We talked about this subject earlier. If we haven't hit the falling frames yet, we add 1.5 pixels. Otherwise, we see if we hit the ground. If so, we're done. If we didn't hit the ground and a jump is not in progress, we add falling velocity. Again, this is super simplified. The code itself does a lot more. Although many more things happen in these subroutines, I'll bet you can already see a big problem. Throughout the course of the jump, both of these subroutines are called. First the left one, then the right one. When we jump at the right wall, the toe collision is responsible for zeroing out the jump frame counter and X velocities. It cancels the jump. Shortly after that, the second subroutine sees that the jump is not in progress and skips ahead. The jump frame counter is zero, so we've reached falling frames, so to speak. We haven't hit the ground and the jump is no longer in progress, falling velocity begins. That is how we slide down the right wall. We've seen the numbers do this before. We transition from using jump frame velocities to using a falling velocity, albeit not very well. So how about that left wall jump? To start it off, the toe doesn't hit the wall, and that puts us in an uh-oh state. None of these instructions are executed. The second subroutine sees that we jumped and hit our head, and our heel and shin didn't hit a potential platform, or whatever this part does. The X and Y velocities are erased, and now we are broken. The game considers the jump to be in progress. The jump frame counter still exists. However, there are no velocities to move us. Frame after frame, the jump frame counter counts down, and the velocities from the lookup table are erased, so long as the jump is in progress. If we perform the jump and use the log, you can see how Strider's Y position remains the same as the jump frame counter counts down. It isn't until we run out of table and fall velocity finally takes over that we return to the ground, either by design or sheer luck. Can we fix it somewhat? I have an untested solution that will probably break five other things. Let's try it. Here's the velocity clear logic in the second subroutine. Let's take this line that clears the X velocity integer and move it to a new subroutine at this address. There are zeros stored at that address right now. I hope they aren't important. 
We'll replace the line we copied with a call to our new subroutine. We'll also include logic to clear the jump frame counter and return from the subroutine. Again, this code change is for making a video. It's not a real fix. Let's see it in action. Jumping toward the left wall above the overhang now throws us toward the ground, just like when we jump at the right wall. The logic flow inside the second subroutine has been altered from this stuck state as illustrated to this. We now have a canceled jump and therefore also have falling velocity. We don't get stuck in the air. This same logic cancels our jump when hitting our head on the ceiling and sends us back to the ground. Did this change break something else? Maybe, but it works for our video. Rewriting environmental collision detection would definitely be advantageous. It would squash a lot of bugs and improve performance. This brings us to our final deep dive, the rather difficult to execute triangle jump. In several areas of Strider, it may be necessary to reach a higher level that a normal jump will not allow. When that happens, it's time to execute a triangle jump. As per the manual, jump toward a wall and when you hit it, jump again in the opposite direction. Even though it's described in the manual, the November-December 1989 issue of Nintendo Power addressed the maneuver due to how difficult it can be to perform it. Their recommended technique is to jump at a wall and just as you hit that wall, press the A button repeatedly and rock the control pad left and right. It also recommends a turbo controller if you have one. After having seen the code, this is pretty good advice. Better grab a taco because we are going to walk the requirements for executing a triangle jump. Let's assume the player jumped off the ground while pressing right. Here's the short version of what needs to happen. The first thing you have to do is collide with the wall to cancel the jump by clearing the jump frame counter. This has to be done or you cannot execute an additional jump. The second thing is probably what gets most people into trouble. Strider has to switch the direction he is facing before jumping off the wall. More on that in a bit. Finally, press A to perform a wall jump. Repeat as many times as necessary. This may seem simple, but the details and the logic make it difficult. First of all, when a jump is executed, that initial controller action is saved to RAM. Jump left, jump right, or jump straight up are the three possibilities. Whenever you attempt to jump again, this value is referenced to make sure that you change direction versus the previous, and first in our case, jump. Next, hitting the wall. The target used to determine collision occurred with the wall is here, the same target we've been talking about throughout this video. It isn't bad as a collision target for canceling a jump so you fall down a wall, but it is a little close to Strider for anticipating the chaining of another action after wall collision. It would be nice if Logic either used a target further away to determine if a second jump could be chained yet, or stick Strider to a wall for a few frames if a jump was in progress when he hit that wall, similar to what a different game would do a few months later. And now the worst part of it all, the change in direction and press jump requirement. Here we have an odd problem with logic flow and input verification. Let's use screens to illustrate time passing in moments of execution for certain logic. Time passes as we move down each screen and from left to right. We jumped at the right wall, collided, the jump was canceled, and we pressed left and A to jump again off of that right wall. The controller input left plus A is picked up here at the bottom of our first frame of examination. The inputs are saved to RAM and they're going to give us a headache here shortly. Multiple places in RAM are used. What buttons were pressed? What buttons were pressed in the previous frame? What button presses are different versus the previous frame? Techniques such as these are used in more games than just Strider. It helps track an initial press of a button, holding down a button, releasing a button, and more. Programming has to consider these things. So we pick up left plus A, make note of controller changes, and move to action processing during the next frame. Can we perform a triangle jump? No jump is currently in progress thanks to our earlier wall collision, so perhaps we can. The first relevant criteria to isolate in our deep dive is the controller change status in RAM. This is what the triangle jump logic uses to determine if the A button was just pressed. It was. A few lines of code later, it checks to see which direction Strider is facing and looks behind him to make sure there is a wall to kick for a jump. Uh oh, guess what? The logic that sets Strider's direction, another value maintained in RAM, has not been executed yet for this frame, so he hasn't turned around yet. It won't be executed until about here, a very short while later. So the game believes he is still facing right. The criteria for the triangle jump fails because there is no wall within a certain number of pixels behind him. Now what? 
Frame execution continues, his direction is eventually changed to facing left, and we reach the controller read logic once again. It's highly likely that the player is still pressing both left and A at this moment as only 1 60th of a second has passed since our last controller read. So we read it again, and the same buttons come back. And now the previous frames controller press is equal to the current frames controller press. No difference means that the change status value in RAM is set to zero because the same buttons are being pressed versus the last frame. Uh-oh, again. So now we roll into the third frame to check the triangle jump once more, and this time we fail the A button press logic because, well, pressed or not, the criteria we check for an A button press is whether or not there was a change versus the previous frame, that the A button was just pressed. The only potential way to salvage the jump is to let go of the A button and press it again. Observe how quickly you move down the wall in real time. If you press A and the jump doesn't work, it is likely you'll take too long to think of trying to press it again. So yeah, Nintendo Power had it right. As soon as you hit the wall, go nuts on the controller to try to get things to activate properly. If you collide with the right wall and press left and A at the same time, the triangle jump will fail because you aren't facing left yet. If you collide with the right wall and press A just before pressing left, it will fail for the same reason. If you jump right, hit the wall and press left slightly before you press A, it should work. Then you still have to manage to repeat the sequence multiple times over while reversing the left-right direction each time. And don't forget that the frame counter must be under 42 in order to clear the jump frame counter and cancel the jump. If you jump from the right wall to the left wall, you will likely hit the wall before reaching 42. So you also need to stall a little bit before pressing right and then jump. Oh, and keep in mind, some physics are bypassed during scrolling. Your controller input sequence might be perfect, but it's possible physics routines we covered earlier won't clear your jump frame counter. You can see when the physics are bypassed during scrolling because the red targets flicker. If our brain had laces, we just tied our shoes together and face planted. Can we fix it? Yes. I have a solution thanks to a small change and about 30 seconds worth of testing. First of all, let's illustrate the default heel kicks using a script. I'll place a box on the screen for collision detection. Red means failure, green means success. They are set to linger for several frames. We'll also monitor the jump frame timer countdown and the direction Strider is facing. Failing to execute is pretty easy to do, and it really comes down to what is ultimately frame perfect timing. What we can do is zero in on the controller requirement for the triangle jump that demands a difference in buttons pressed versus the previous frame. Instead of timing the jump for the exact moment the A button is pressed, why not just see if the A button is currently pressed at this moment in the code? Hopefully, the many other requirements for a triangle jump will help keep this change from abusing Strider's otherwise perfect physics. Instead of address 5A, we will use address 47 hex, which holds the current status for controller 1. Not only does this add forgiveness for when you press A, it lets you simply hold down the A button and rock the D-pad back and forth to triangle jump off the walls. Give it a try using this game genie code. The collision boxes for the heel kick show that many more checks are performed, which isn't great for performance, but they only appear in the middle of a triangle jump criteria check. Okay, that's, you know what, that's enough. Like and subscribe for more videos like this one. I also have a Patreon available if you are interested, and thanks for watching.